good morning. Welcome to Empty Cross Ministries Sunday School or Bible, stu Bible Study. Hang on just a second here. I need to straighten some things out. Okay. We're going to be looking at Job chapter 38 verses 1, 4, 16, 17. And then we're going to jump to Job chapter 42 verses 1, 2, and 5. And then we're going to jump to the New Testament we're going to be looking at Mark 16, 1 through 14, and verse 20. So let's get started here. This is Job, chapter 38, verses 1, 4, 16, and 17. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? Have the gates of death been open unto thee? Or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Now we come to Job 42, verses 1, 2, and 5. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth. And we come to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 14, and verse 20. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they, laid, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto, and he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly, and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that he had that had, and she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not unto them which had been seen him after he was risen. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. <clears throat> Those who want definitive answers will find the passages we just discussed today virtually unsatisfactory. Those who are willing to trust will find that when human understanding fails, God is still there. In biblical research, there is an area of study called apologetics. Apologetics seeks to defend the truth of Christianity by finding answers to perplexing questions. Apologetics has its place. Many have found it comforting to know that Christianity is intellectually respectable. You don't have to check your brain at the door when you go to church. Many are heartened when they find out there are explanations for the things they have been told were contradictions. Still, there are elements of faith that depend on trust. Our understanding may well be built on what we can reason through and be convinced of, but the human mind cannot comprehend all that God knows. Parents often discover that their children ask questions that the parents cannot answer satisfactorily. The parents may indeed know the answer, 
but the reason that the parents can't fully respond to the question is that their children do not yet have the intellectual ability to grasp the answers. So parents try to answer as simply and honestly as they can, hoping that the children will trust them when the answers seem incomprehensible. In today's lesson, we will see that Job is satisfied with God's response, even though he does not get answers to all his questions. Hundreds of years later, Jesus' disciples will preach the gospel everywhere. They will do this with incomplete knowledge of God's future plans. But they will have enough knowledge to trust God and obey. This lesson sets two passages of scripture in counterpoint, one from Job and the other from Mark. The passage in the book of Job offers a personal encounter between God and Job. The second from Mark deals with the personal encounter between the risen Christ and his disciples. How do these two passages fit together? They both deal with difficult issues. They both deal with the need to trust. Both passages provide tangible reasons to trust. In the first passage, God appears to Job and honors his request for a personal meeting. Many of Job's questions go unanswered, but Job is content in fellowship with God. Job is content to trust in the God who gives life. Some of Job's unanswered questions are dealt with in the passage from Mark elsewhere in the New Testament. Job wondered about life after death. Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection settled the issue. Job wondered why the good suffer. Jesus was perfect, yet he faced horrific suffering. The disciples had something in common with Job personal encounter with God caused them to trust God for what was not clear. Back in Job 13.13, 13, Job asked for an audience with God. God now answers that bold request. There is an old cliche, be careful what you ask for because you just may get it. Job is about to get it. This is Job 38 verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Isn't it interesting that God speaks through a whirlwind or storm? It would seem that Job has had enough storms. After all, it was a windstorm that killed his children. His friends had accused him of uttering words that amounted to nothing more than strong wind. This storm is different, however. This storm announces the presence of God. God's presence occasionally is associated with storms elsewhere in the Old Testament. We can look at Jeremiah 23:19 and Jeremiah 30:23, Ezekiel 1:4, Nahum 1:3, Zechariah 9:14 and contrast contrast that with 1 Kings 19:11 and 12. But none of those associations is quite like this one. Verse 4 of chapter, Job chapter 38. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Using a particular teaching method, God answers Job's questions with questions of his own. The questions are rhetorical. They don't really need an audible answer from Job because both God and Job know what the point of the question is. Through his questions, God reminds Job that he was not there when the earth was planned. God was the one there at creation, not Job. This passage also reinforces the idea that the world is not here by accident. God designed it. Verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in search, in the search of the depth? Modern underwater explorers such as Jack Ballard can take us to the depths of the sea, but Job has not been there. He does not understand its secrets. The sea is a fearful and mysterious place to ancient Middle Eastern peoples. Job's people and those around him probably are not seafarers. Even those today who know the ocean who know the ocean well are stunned by its mystery. In some ways it still remains a great mystery, having been called Earth's last frontier. Our increased knowledge of the sea today should cause us to walk in even greater humility before the creator of that sea. We come now to verse 17. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? As Job has not been to the depths of the sea, neither has he seen beyond the gates of death. He has not seen what lies beyond this life. None of us will be able to have a practice or trial run. Death, no movie or book can 
prepare us for what will happen. Medical science cannot answer all the unknowns. Death is still in the hands of God. You may have heard about the backwoods fellow who sent his son off to college to get some book learning. Well, the son came home from Christmas break. The father said, son, tell us something in arithmetic. The son thought back to his course in geometry and replied, Pi R squared. This is the formula for calculating, calculating the area of a circle. Embarrassed, the father rebuked the young man. Son, everyone knows pies are round. Cornbread are squares. Despite his bad grammar, the backwoods father was correct in his conclusion. The problem was that the limits of his knowledge didn't allow him to see what his son was really talking about. And when we compare our knowledge and perspective with that of God, this can be our problem too. To help Job see his place in the overall scheme of things, God asks dozens of questions. No matter how smart we are, compared with God, we are like the backwoods father. We have ample reason to be humble about our ignorance. We also do well to remember that more knowledge doesn't always lead to greater wisdom. Think again on the issue of pi. Most of us learned its mathematical value to be 3.14, or perhaps we learned it to be a few more decimal places. Not satisfied with this, a certain college professor used a computer to calculate pi out to 1.24 trillion places. This is definitely greater knowledge, but is it greater wisdom? Job's response to go. Job. Job's response to God, which we will see next, shows his spiritual wisdom. If it ever comes down to having to choose between greater knowledge or greater wisdom, the path is clear. <clears throat> this is Job chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. We know... We now reach the climax of the book. Job admits his limitations and testifies to God's absolute power. Job also confesses the ability of God to know. We often forget that God knows our hearts, our very thoughts. See especially Psalm 139 verses 1 through 4 for this. We can react in one of two ways, shrink back in horror or open ourselves to him. Verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now, mine eye seeth thee. How is it that Job has heard of God? At the time, there may not be much, if any, of the Old Testament ever written. Even so, Job says that he has heard of God. All of us depend to some extent on what others tell us of their spiritual pilgrimage. Job's faith is no longer a hearsay faith. Now his eye seeth. He does not mean to say that he literally has seen God. Rather, he means that his faith is now personal and experiential. The hope of, Job, uh, hope of Job, 1927, is realized. The presence of God is better than intellectual answers. Grieving people often will state that the most helpful thing another person can do is just to be there. We come now to the New Testament part of our lesson. Here in the Gospel of Mark, we can find more complete answers to the dilemma that Job faced. As we begin, we find ourselves with the woman who struggled with the unfair and seemingly meaningless death of Christ. <clears throat> Verses 1 through 7 of Mark chapter 16. Verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Jesus' body had been taken down from the cross in a hurry because of a special Sabbath approach. Some of the women now come to finish the burial preparations. Mary Magdalene is part of the delegation. Jesus had delivered her from great spiritual oppression. The second Mary, who is the mother of James, is unknown to us. Salome is the mother of James and John. The first to witness the resurrection are not priests, the Romans, or even Jesus' closest eleven disciples. Rather, he reveals himself to a group of women who had supported his ministry and had been blessed by him. Verse 2. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. The first day of the week is, of course, Sunday. The Jews worship on Saturday according to Sabbath regulations. Before Christ's resurrection, 
there is no particular significance to the first day of the week. This is a normal work day to these women. They arrive at the tomb at about dawn. This is just a simple historical detail, but it also has some poetic meaning for us. It, surely, it is surely the dawn of a new era when Jesus rises from the dead. Verse 3, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away from the stone? Who shall roll... Verse 3, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? Burial places are often carved into the sides of hills in ancient Palestine. There may be several burial spots grouped together in one room. The entrance would be covered by a large stone. The concern of the woman is the removal of that stone. No doubt such an effort will take several strong hands. The women apparently are in such a rush that they don't remember this important fact until they are almost there. Verse 4, And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. To their surprise, the stone is rolled away already. This means that they now have full access to Jesus' body inside. At least two of these women had seen the tomb and its, previous, and its stone previously. They know where to go and what to look for. How did they get there? The question is common reaction from people upon first seeing the circle of monoliths of Stonehenge in England. The upright stones weigh up to 40 tons. How the prehistoric builders could raise the stones and how they could put the horizontal caps in place is still a source of speculation. An equally relevant question is why did they get there? Stonehenge is just one of several similar arrangements of stones spread across the Salisbury Plain of England. It was once theorized that the monuments were prehistoric astronomical observatories. More recently, researchers have found evidence that the complexes were ancient burial grounds and crude temples for the worship of druidic deities. People flock to the sites yet today to conduct pagan worship. Compare those stones with the one that blocked the entrance to Jesus' tomb. That stone may still exist somewhere, where it may have been broken down into smaller rocks century ago and scattered. We don't care. The stone existed to be cast aside by the power of God so Jesus' followers could see that the tomb was empty. The continued presence of Stonehenge serves as a mute testimony to the futility of idolatry. The absence of the stone that sealed Jesus' tomb serves as evidence for the truth of the Christian faith. That stone is missing for our benefit. We come to verse 5. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in the long white garment, and they were frightened. Inside the tomb, the women see what Mark describes as a young man. He appears seated beside the shelf that had contained the body of Jesus. We are not meant to understand this man as a normal human being. Putting all the gospel accounts together, it is clear that this is an angel. The women, understandably, are gripped with fear. Come to verse 6. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Even without asking, the angel knows whom they seek. He informs them that they will not find Jesus in the tomb, but that he is risen. As partial proof, the angel even allows them to look at the place where Jesus' body had been laid. Full proof will come when they see their risen Lord. Verse 7, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, as he, said in the, as he said unto you. The women are given a mission. Remind the disciples that Jesus had promised to meet them in Galilee. That area, particularly its city of Capernaum, had been Jesus' base of operation. Most of his disciples are from Galilee. The Gospel of John relates Jesus meeting his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, having breakfast with them and teaching them after his resurrection. We now come to verses 8 through 14 and 20. Verse 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The scene at the tomb prompts several actions on the part of the women. First, they leave quickly. The angel had told the woman in verse 7 to tell his disciples, but at least for a while the woman seemed to be too, too frightened to say anything to any man. 
Their fear is coupled, understandably, with amazement. After calming down, the women speak freely. Verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Even though Jesus appears to these women briefly, he has a specific meeting with Mary Magdalene. It was Mary Magdalene who was last at the cross and first at the tomb. Verses 10 and 11. And she went and told them that he had been with him, and they mourned and wept, and they, had, and went, and they, when they had heard that he was alive, and had been seen of her, believed not. Mary's dramatic announcement comes as Jesus' followers express grief over the death of Jesus. It must be quite frustrating for Mary when at first they do not believe her. Others will soon have the same experience that Mary had. An important part of the Christian message is that the first reports of Jesus' resurrection were met with skepticism by his closest followers. They aren't expecting it. They are not out preaching confidently. Just wait a few days. You'll see. Rather, they are cowering behind locked doors. Verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them, and as they walked and went into the country. This refers to the encounter that Jesus has with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. This story is told more fully, more fully in Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 55. Two disciples, one named Cleopas, the other not named, travel with Jesus as they journey away from Jerusalem. They have conversations about the Messiah and the death of Christ, but they do not recognize Jesus. As night approaches, they invite Jesus to stay with him. Eventually, they recognize him. We know there were many appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. This one is particularly sweet. Now we come to verse 13. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Like Mary, the disciples on the road also faced skepticism. This counters the claim of some critics that the story of Jesus' resurrection was the product of some psychological wish fulfillment. It is claimed that the disciples' desire to see him alive produces the belief that he, he indeed is alive. The Bible, however, portrays the disciples as quite slow to accept the news that Jesus is risen. Verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the leaven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. The appearance of Jesus in the body are very mysterious to us. He does not have to obey the laws of nature, laws that he created. But he is no mere phantom either. He can eat food and does so. On the occasion mentioned here, Jesus has to speak sternly to the eleven because of their lack of faith and discernment. This is hardness of heart. The phrase, because they believe not them which had seen him after he was risen, means that Jesus expects us to believe credible testimony about him. Very few people have had the privilege of seeing the risen Jesus personally, but Jesus still expects belief. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. This is a summary statement of all that happens in the earliest church. Above all, the word is preached. It is obvious that the Lord blesses the efforts of the, as the disciples are able to do the things that Jesus himself did. We're coming into the Christmas season, but I'm going to talk about Easter. Because without Easter, Christmas is meaningless. What does Easter mean to you? God did not explain the meaning of suffering in the book of Job, but Job was satisfied with God's presence. After Jesus' ascension, the disciples were satisfied too because they knew they eventually would be in Jesus' presence for eternity. Do you eagerly await the personal presence of God, like Job who stood humbly before the Father? We stand humbly before Mark's account and admit that there is much we don't understand. Like Job, we may, think that we may think that more knowledge is what we really need. Yet the gospel accounts of the resurrection, as brief as they are, are what the Father has decided we should have. They are enough to assure us of God's presence, both now and in the age to come. A Sunday school teacher once asked, What does Easter mean to you? One boy answered honestly, 
egg salad sandwiches for the next three weeks. <laughs> we all know that Easter is more than eggs, bunnies, and flowers. Still, many do not contemplate the absolute changes it signifies. If Jesus is risen, then he is who he claimed to be. If he is risen, then the truth claims of the Bible are validated. If he is risen, then there is life after death that is only hinted at in Job 14.14 14 and in 19.25. The death and resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Because he died, our sin penalty is paid, and we can come into the presence of God. Because Jesus rose again, he defeated death. This allows us to be in God's presence for all eternity. I want to say this before we have a closing prayer. The presence of the Lord is better than answers. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that our Redeemer does live and that we shall live again. Help us to be ready to experience new life as well as to live well in this one through the risen Christ. Amen. And I'm going to see if I can get some music going here. So